I have uh, received some emails and some comments and even text messages uh, and phone calls. People asking me, what are you doing? How are you guys, um, how are you guys doing? And also, what is it that you guys are doing during this um, very interesting and strange time that we're all in? And, you know, I don't have the answers. Like I said in a previous uh, video that I did, uh, when JP and I were together, uh, we can't tell you what you can do uh, for your life because what we do for our life may not work for you. But what I can tell you is what we're doing. And what we're doing is uh, shoring up. Um, we planted some starter seeds or starter plants for, you know, vegetables and herbs. Uh, we got all of the necessary equipment to make those plants and vegetables grow as healthy as they could in this environment. Um, in Pittsburgh, it's a lot like Seattle and Portland. It's constant gray skies, kind of cold, uh, rainy weather. Uh, I'm hoping the weather changes soon, though, and gets a little bit warmer. Um, so that's what we're doing. We're also cleaning our house. You know, we're doing big cleaning, you know, cleaning days. Like, um, as you can see, I'm sitting on the couch and, and uh, you know, enjoying my, my time at home. Um, we are, uh, you know, doing, we have big cleaning days. So, you know, vacuuming, dusting, making sure that everything's clean so that, you know, we're living clean and, you know, somewhat antiseptic lives. Um, but at the same time, we are um, stocking up on bulk items like rice and dried beans. Uh, and we're getting fresh fruit and produce uh, when we can. And we're eating that pretty quickly. Um, and trying to replenish that as, um, you know, as we go through it. Uh, we're trying to cut down on sugar, so we're drastically cutting down on our sugar, and, you know, if we do have a little bit uh, of alcohol, it's usually just like a glass of wine with dinner, maybe every other night, and then we um, maybe have a cocktail once a week. Today is April 1st, and so we are fasting. We've decided to start a fasting uh, routine, which means that um, we will, that we've never done it before, so we're starting slow, so we won't be eating until uh, this evening when we have our one meal today, which will be dinner. Um, and we'll, we plan on doing that, like maybe, we're gonna start out maybe like once a month, and then we're going to increase that as time goes on. So we thought today being the first um, the first day of the month that that would be a good time to, to start. Um, plus JP has a dental appointment today so um, you know he doesn't need to be eating anyway so we thought it would be a, a, a good time to take advantage of that. Um, so that's what we're doing and you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna walk a little bit. I'm just gonna walk and and you know while I'm sitting on my couch enjoying being inside I'm just gonna walk and talk to you um, the uh, the situation is unprecedented and you know we have some of the greatest intellectual thinkers of our time saying things like the only way that this could ever um, turn around and the only way that this could ever really go back to a semblance of what it was is through divine intervention. So in other words it would take an act of God to to reset this and fix it and, and get it back to normal. Um, I think that a lot of people are in denial about what's ahead and I'm not here to criticize that level of deniability because that is a natural reaction to this unprecedented historical moment that will go down in history books as the greatest act of fascism that ever was allowed 
against the entire global population. It seems so strange, doesn't it? It's almost unbelievable. I don't know if you're like me, but you wake up every day and you go, is this really happening? Is this an April Fool's joke? Is everything gonna go back to normal? But you know that it's not. And even if you are working from home and you're commuting from home and still getting a paycheck and you still live a fairly comfortable life, you know that something isn't right. You know that. And I think that um, you have to listen to those little voices inside of you that, you know, that you tend to drown out with whatever is coming down the uh, the news the newsreel or whatever's coming down your news feed. And one of the things also that JP and I have done um, is we've stepped away from social media. Uh, we'll we'll go in and we'll load up our social media feed with information um, that will hopefully promote critical thought, and then we walk away. We walk away for a day or two days, and then we come back and uh, check in and, you know, listen to what other people are saying and, and try to, you know, try to get, engage in as much respectful dialogue as we can. Um, you know, this is a very, like I said, like I keep saying over and over again, this is unprecedented. So not everybody is going to react appropriately. Some people might say things that are really offensive and people might take a personal offense to things. And I go back to something that my father told me before he died and something that both, both my parents um, have ins instilled in me a long time ago. And it was this, the message was don't sweat the small stuff. You know, um, don't be critical of uh, somebody's grammar or critical of somebody's, um, you know, inability to understand, you know, what the world is really like and how the system really works and all that stuff. You know, don't be critical because there will come a day when you will need to gather your brain and gather your critical thought critical thinking skills and gather your courage and your strength and you don't want to waste it on policing someone's grammar or worrying about offending people when that offense doesn't actually cause any real legitimate harm because there will come a day when legitimate harm will come upon society and that is when you need to be you need to gather your strength. That is where you need to be critical. That is where you need to say, it's a good thing I didn't waste my time and energy on things that really didn't matter because now it matters, doesn't it? Um, so that's something that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, I don't have a great, <laughs> right now I'm not even speaking to my mother, I haven't spoken to her in three years, but those words do really are very impactful and I do go back to them from time to time. So she wasn't all bad, right? Um, and so we're, so what's happening now as we're witnessing this complete collapse of society as you know it, yeah. um, as we're witnessing this collapse of society and this indoctrination period, this is what we're going through right now. We're yeah. going through an indoctrination. Uh, think of people who, who are indoctrinated into cults all right, so it's raining a little bit, so I'm, that's why I'm going like that a lot. <laughs> um, think of pe about people who are indoctrinated into cults. cults. Cult leaders, they prey upon people who've been damaged or people who have been, uh, you know, abused. And so they are, they're weak uh, or, or, you know, not, in, not because they're, they're bad and, and, and weak because they're bad, but they're weak because they've been traumatized. So think of all of the people in the world who have been traumatized over, let's start with 9-11. First, we had 9-11, which was this incredibly traumatic experience for the entire globe, especially for the United States, especially for New Yorkers. Then think of, you know, all of the things that have happened after that. The, you know, how 9-11 was used as an excuse to invade Middle Eastern countries, which caused great devastation and ruin and the loss of millions of lives. And all of that latent trauma that those Middle Eastern countries felt was then attached to us somehow because we were the, you know, we were the invaders, right? We were empire taking over, right? 
And then um, on our own soil, we had, you know, school shootings and all sorts of, and church shootings and synagogue shootings and, and theater shootings and, and, you know, concert venue shootings. And so all of these traumatic events, you know, were, uh, were done to us. You know, we were made into a traumatic society and a traumatic society or a trauma victim doesn't have the capacity to really recognize when they're being fucked with, you know, um, except for a few keyboard warriors out there who seem to get it. Um, so here you are in this, here you are, the victim of all this abuse and all this trauma, and now this. So of course you're going to stay at home and close up shop and close down your business and follow follow orders and all this stuff. Of course you are, because you've been so traumatized. You're looking for someone to save you. You're looking for that leadership to tell you that if you do these things, everything will be okay. When it's the leadership itself, it's that leadership, it's that ruling class. It's those government agencies, it's those, you know, corporations that are excoriating you from the inside out, you know? So here I am, sitting on my couch, safe inside, you know, having these thoughts. And I felt like I should really respond to those people who are saying, how do you do it? How do you and JP stay so strong? How did you know? How did you know is, is some of the questions that we're getting. How did you know that this was gonna happen? Well, we pay attention to history. Um, we're not, you know, psychic you know we we pay attention to the way that that you know this country has operated since its inception we were founded as a fiscal military state so the goal is to take over other countries when you're a military state and you make money that way so all of the global leaders i guess got together and decided to excoriate their own citizenry and their own uh, constituents and and uh, make money through you know this complete and total um, abuse of an already traumatized society to me that seems pretty simple and that's you know that's how it is um, like I said it's raining so it's I'm getting wet <laughs> and I don't have an umbrella because I don't usually carry umbrellas because they're kind of a pain and I would always lose them right but I'm gonna say also talk about some fun things um, I was thinking that what would be really cool is if you could think of times in your life that were really interesting and fun and during this time of forced isolation and during this time of forced incarceration and this indoctrination period where our, our um, abusers uh, and, you know, and our, uh, our oppressors are trying to get us to a point where, where we feel that they're the only ones that can save us. That's called Stockholm Syndrome. Um, during this time, I thought, why am I having these really like funny, interesting thoughts um, about, about my life? Things that I would never really truly think about. and. I have to, you know, say that I had this particular memory come to mind uh, as a result of something that I, another podcaster had said. He, it was Scott on, on Church Dog 42. <laughs> he had said, you know, JP and Julie over there in Pittsburgh, they uh, live streamed for 12 hours, uh, 1984. And I was like, oh, yes, we did. <laughs> and we're going to be doing... Uh, we're going to be doing a, another live stream of another um, dystopian novel that apparently was used as the blueprint for society right now. Um, but when he's, so what he said was JP and Julie did this thing and he's like, you know, I seem to recall back in the 1990s, so I'm Generation X, so I totally, and Scott and I are probably about the same age, I totally know what he's talking about. He's talking about a place called Blockbuster Video. And he said that he remembered going into Blockbuster Video and asking to rent the movie, wanting to see if he could rent the movie 1984, and the person behind the, the counter had never heard of it. 
so and then I said to myself blockbuster video oh wow so I went and I, I actually did find my old blockbuster card believe it or not and I thought blockbuster video remember that place you would go in and you would rent movies um and usually when you would go into a blockbuster video and by the way the buildings were always these like blue it was like a blue and yellow motif um i might have to put my hood up because i am getting wet um it's like a blue and yellow coloring Ugh, there <laughs> that's a little better it looks silly but whatever um and you could always tell that it was a blockbuster video building, right? I mean, it was pretty obvious, right? Uh, because of the coloring. And, uh, but you remember those experiences? I mean, I don't, you may not, if you're listening, you may be too young or maybe you just never went into a blockbuster video. But usually what would happen is you'd go in with friends, okay? And they would have like movie candy. They sometimes would have popcorn that you could, you know, buy right there. And they had, you know, hundreds of thousands of movies that you could rent. And it was always some, it was always some kid who had crazy colored hair. And he probably had just come at, come in from the back after smoking, you know, smoking a joint. And so he was a little out of it. <laughs> and he always had some weird movie playing up on the screen. You remember that? Those were your, those were your blockbuster video experiences. And for some reason, when Scott mentioned, you know, the whole business of going into a blockbuster video in the 1990s and wanting to rent 1984 and it wasn't available, I thought, wow, those experiences were really interesting and chances are, and those are little, little snippets of your life that seem really, really innocuous and really stupid and not any part of anything, you know, uh, important in a historical context but there they are those are the, the the strange memories that are coming coming back I have to fix my camera I think there we go um, and you know it's just amazing what you think of right when when you're sort of in this forced incarceration um, and and you're also being told that you have to be in a constant state of trauma and and uh, you know sort of in this reactive uh, place where everything is troubling and and scary you know um, that's a train that's cool things are still still functioning on a quasi-normal level. Do I know what the future will hold? Kind of. Do I want to tell you? Not really. I don't want to do that to you. But what I can say is that it's, 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 it's too late. They've won. <laughs> um, and you know, and, and there's a little nervous laughter behind there because it's so strange to say out loud, but yeah, I mean, it was a coordinated attack. It's a coordinated attack by the people with all the money and all the power against the rest of us. Uh, I also find it interesting that a few days ago, um, an article came out in the International Business Times that talked about how uh, uh, Kate Middleton and her husband, um, Prince William, uh, are now taking over the, the role of the monarch in, you know, and I'm guessing that that means that because of the pandemic, the queen was forced to abdicate the throne. So she and her husband, Prince Philip, are holed up in Windsor Castle. Now, do I really give a shit about what the monarchy are doing? No. But I do pay attention to things like, you know, words and symbology and things like that. So we do know that this whole thing has brought about this deep-seated fear and hatred of old people. 
the message that you know all the grandchildren are being told throughout the entire globe is that they could be carrying a terrible virus which could kill granny and grandpa and that if they cared at all about anything they should just stay the hell away from them and so they've quarantined all the old people and I guess that even goes for the monarchs right for the royals so they've quarantined the royals and here comes the fertile young vibrant you know royals to take their place so corona so n novel coronavirus new crown come on I mean you have to be asleep at the wheel not to see all of this you know simulations <laughs> that took place of course you know starting back in 2010 with the Rockefeller Foundation and then of course in 2019 with the Bill Gates Foundation but then all of the the symbology and you know the naming of the virus and then the installation of, of William and Kate the young fresh faces of of royalty I mean this is all ridiculous and it's all so it's it's so easy it's insulting isn't it insulting you know it's a little insulting right so I would say that if you are concerned about the future if you're concerned about what the future holds then you have to think about leaving a legacy and if you don't have any money and if you don't have any power you might feel that you don't have anything to give and especially when you when you see, keep hearing and seeing over and over and over again through these you know agents of propaganda who are getting quite who are getting paid quite well to break you down so agents of propaganda are like mainstream news they're getting paid to narrate a script and that script is meant to humiliate you it's meant to put fear in you it's meant to control you it's meant to keep you from thinking and a lot of the terminology out there is pretty insidious it comes straight out of fascism things like flattening the curve things like who's essential and who's non-essential well I am very essential I am um, I'm essential because if I hadn't if I hadn't listened to my intuition then things would be a lot different for me and my husband and it goes all the way back you know probably what year is this 2020 so I listened to my intuition when I got back from Europe in the spring of 2012 spring summer of 2012 and by the fall of 2012 I had met him and I was like all right I'm gonna sit down and I'm gonna tell you something the world is gonna to come to an end and you're gonna be my husband okay so because I wanted somebody like him who knew how to live off the land who knew how to you know gather rain and knew how to eat from the from the the earth and knew what best way to keep us from falling into despair of keeping busy always being of use so what the what the the the, the goal of this whole entire process is to keep you from feeling as if you are are essential human beings are born and the thing that makes them human is to be of use in some way to create and one of the things about S Silicon Valley that is so insidious and so decrepit in in any kind of moral way is the term that became hashtag so quickly disruptive technology Silicon Valley is about disruption all those apps that you have on your phone they came out of you know 
somebody's idea to disrupt you, to disrupt your life, to disrupt the organic process of being of use. That is what disruptive technology is about. You know, so a lot of these Silicon Valley wannabes and all these tech tech people, you know, who wanted to make a lot of money at Facebook and Google and all the other different, you know, the, the various apparatus out there that's that's funneling all of our information. It's called extraction capitalism now. That's what I call it. Um, but it's even worse than that because they're extra extracting, you know, everything that, that makes you a human being. They're extracting that out, that out of you uh, through trauma and feedback loops and algorithms that cause uh, addiction, feed, uh, addiction entrapment scenarios in you. Uh, so they created the uh, this idea that disruptive technology was the best thing ever, and so you would, you know, they would go on these interviews, and that would be the catchphrase. That would be the thing that all of the the Silicon Valley wannabes would say so that they could get that big fat paycheck. Oh, we're all about disruptive technology. Hire us, you know? So, you have to think about how insidious that is. Disruption means destruction, doesn't it? To disrupt something. Think about, like, if you're sitting having a picnic with your friends and family, and all of a sudden a big storm comes and disrupts your those organic moments that you know you may never get back so that's what Silicon Valley is about disrupting those moments disrupting those healthy moments that when you get together with people you can come up with ideas that can really perpetuate actual solutions so in some ways technology is the best thing that's ever happened and in some ways it's the worst thing that's ever happened there's no there's no doubt about that you know, I'm not dissing technology. I'm not looking down on technology. What I'm saying, though, is that it was used for, it was used for pretty evil purposes. I mean, and it, and they even told you that it was that it was uh, used for evil evil purposes when they would go around the media and go out there in the world and say we're all about disruptive technology, thinking and and so you didn't realize that because some people don't know what words mean you didn't realize that that statement was actually an attempt to destroy your life you know so we're looking at some pretty pretty interesting times now where you know a combination of dis disruptive technology and psychopathy from the ruling class like from the Bill Gates Foundation and David Attenborough and all these people and from the Federal Reserve and all this stuff that's happening financially and economically to us um, when you've got, you know, that amount of, 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 of just depraved, uh, amoral or immoral goals happening, you know, it feels really oppressive, like you can't fight it, but, and the thing is, is that you can't, um, you can't fight it. Like I said before, it's too late. So what you need to do now is you need to, to look deep, deep within yourself and say, what is my legacy? What is my legacy that I can leave for somebody? You know, whether it's a child or somebody else that you can pass on and they can continue the conversation. Um, because, you know, things are going to change rapidly in your life. And you are never ever going back to the way things were before this took place. Um, and that, I would say, that's the first thing you need to understand. Is is the you have to accept the um, the reality of of the situation. You have to accept reality. You also have to recognize that you're in, abu in an abusive relationship, or you were in one. I kind of feel that they've, they've let go. There's a lot of fear that, that they, the, the ruling class, the government bodies out there, that you know, play a song and dance over the years to distract us from all of their malevolent you know, goals, right? Um,
you know, <laughs> I can't, I can't stress this enough. I mean, we're not going back. We're not going back. So you have to accept that reality. And just like, you know, an abused spouse has to go through a period of quiet time to really accept the reality that the person she married isn't the person she thought. You know, that this person is, or the person she ended up living with, that this person is actually an abusive psychopath. And that, it, you know, but first you have to accept that. You have to accept that. The same people that are hurting you and creating the fear in you are not the same people that are going to save you. They're telling you they are, but they're not, you know. Um, so, you know, before you can have any kind of revolution, you have to have an evolution of your thoughts. You have to have an evolution of the mind. And fear is a really great way to control a society. It's the number one way. I mean... But in the American mindset, like in the way that, that a lot of Americans like raise their kids, they use fear as a way to, to get their kids to behave. So this is something that's been so deeply indoctrinated into us from the beginning of time, and I'm sure it's not just Americans, but so fear is, a, is the mechanism by, by which, you know, a society or a child can be controlled. I'm not a child, and I am a society unto my own, so I have sovereignty and autonomy over my body and myself. As you can see, I'm lounging on my couch right now, really enjoying being inside out of the rain. So I know when I'm being gaslighted, I know when I'm being abused, I recognize narcissistic behavior, I recognize the psychopathy that comes with it. And I really hope that you can too. And I don't have the answers. I'm not going to tell you that planting some vegetables in a little garden and getting a rain barrel and collecting rain for when that day comes that you might lose access to clean water. I'm not going to tell you that that's how you should live your life. I'm not going to tell you that life is on the, on the surface is going to end. I'm not going to say that to you, but I do know, but I can tell you that things are not going back to normal. Things are not going back to the way you thought. And, and the reason why doesn't have to do with anything except that they want it to. That's it. That's what they want. You know, the people who control the monetary system because this really has to do with money. It's, it doesn't really have to do with anything else, money and power. You know, so you do have these intellectual powerhouses who, you know, are giving these these interviews and talking about all sorts of different things when it comes to, you know, what's happening to us. And they're saying things like it will take an act of God to to save us. It will take divine intervention. And it reminds me of, you know, what the intellectuals uh, in Nazi Germany were saying when they started witnessing the first stages of fascism because fascism comes really really fast and they recognized it and they and, you know they were all these intellectuals who had these brilliant careers behind them you know professors doctors scientists philosophers great minds and they were saying things like it's going to take an act of God. It's going to take a spiritual awakening, some kind of divine intervention to make this stop. And it didn't stop, did it? Evil won for a little while. And then it got beat down. So it probably won't happen in our lifetime. But eventually, you know, as we step into some dark, dark times that are coming ahead, where, you, where the loss of autonomy and the loss of sovereignty and the loss of privacy is an abomination on a human being. Some people will say, well, what's the big deal? So they're going to put something in me, a vaccine or a chip or something, and it'll just make my life that much easier. And I'll always get, you know, $1,000 a month so that I can live on and feed my kids. Sounds good to me. I'm tired. 
I'm tired of being stressed out. I'm tired of school shootings. I'm tired of, of life. And that's what they're banking on. They're banking on to, for you to say, okay, that sounds good, you know? And some of you will do it, and I don't blame you. I don't blame you for doing it. I mean, I don't blame you. That's, that's what happens, right? So, it's, it's, a, it's a long one, I know. But it's necessary, and it's, uh, and it's time. It's time to have these, you know, real conversations. And it's time to be kind, and it's time to be patient, and it's time to stop sweating the small stuff. You know, um, I like that bridge, by the way. It's bright yellow. <laughs> it's a pretty bridge. It's time to, you know, stop sweating the small stuff. Stop worrying about things that really, truly don't matter. Because your energy and your your brilliant mind and your 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 sense of justice in in the world is is what's going to be needed to to weather this thing. I'm not even saying fight it, you know, to weather it and to document it for historical purposes. It's unprecedented. It's unprecedented. The human race has now changed as a result of this. You know, this is nothing like you have ever experienced before. It's nothing like the globe has ever experienced before. War was waged on the people. War was waged on the people. Economic warfare, class warfare, was waged on the people. And the people are like, they're, you know, they're not recognizing it because a lot of people don't have historical context, you know? A lot of people don't understand that this is what war feels like. You know, there's a lot of denial when, when, you know, when there's war waged on you. So campaigns of aggression don't start with, you know, oh, I'm just going to go to the market and get some milk and then all of a sudden the market blows up. That's not how it starts. It starts a little bit more underground and insidiously than that. It starts with propaganda. It starts with rumors. It starts with false allegations. It starts with fake news. It starts with all sorts of stuff. You know? Wars don't start so obviously. You know? And the thing about this war is that it's the peop it's going it's the people that are being you know, that are having war waged on them. Um, and so it's not that one country is invading another, and so a third country can come in to the assistance of the country that is being invaded. Um, it's not like that this time. There's nobody to save us except ourselves. You know? You have to be an individual with an engaged brain to understand that this war is being waged on you. And they've been preparing for this for a long time through various traumatic events that keep repeating themselves, knowing full well that trauma creates fear and a society can only be controlled through fear. And that's really the gist of it. And it's, it's simple and it's been done for years and it's, you know, it's a little, it's a little uh, on the nose, right? It's a little silly. You know, they don't even have the capacity to, to be creative. Here's a cop. Hold on. Anyway. Um, that's really all I have to say. And I've, I'm glad you were able to take this time with me as I'm sitting on my couch you know, enjoying being inside, out of the rain, you know, staying safe. I would say, too, regarding that, I don't know if you're getting it, I'm getting it a lot, you know, around people who've called me, local people who've called me or texted me, and they end their phone calls or their text messages with, stay safe, stay safe. I would say you could respond to that with, stay sane, <laughs> stay sane, keep your brain engaged. 
um, you know, it's, uh, it's a little insulting because, you know, I've, I've never been afraid of anything. I've walked through the slums of Paris where you would think that my life or my purse would be at risk. A lot of um, pickpockets in Paris, you know. I've also been to Athens, Greece, right after the riots. <laughs> Accidentally left my passport somewhere and my sister-in-law was really mad. She had to go back and retrieve it for me. Um, you know, I'm not really afraid. I don't, you know, I don't, uh, I don't react in fear. I'm cautious and I'm aware and I'm engaged with what's going on. Um, and I encourage you to also be cautious and aware and engage and find those moments in your life that, you know, that may seem kind of silly and why would you ever remember something like that? That's what happens when people are about ready to die. They start to think about the craziest things. That's what's happening, you know. I'm hoping that it doesn't happen very quickly. I'm hoping that it's a slow realization and that people will not be too traumatized by it. But life is over, as you know it. Your new worldview will now be through the lens of yourself or a couple with you and one other person. You will probably never see large crowds, crowds of people getting together again for the rest of your life. And if you have a child, they will grow up in that environment and they'll think that that's normal. That crowds of people getting together and doing things as a group is somehow wrong and against the law. And if they do see it, they'll probably be really upset by it. That's the future. Thank you for watching. Please hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. If you really like our work, you can help support us on a regular basis by going to patreon.com slash book of hours. For as little as $2 a month, you can sustain us and keep us working. You can also make a one-time donation at paypal.me slash book of hours. Thank you.